And now, stand up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe. It's time to stand up with Pete Dominic on vacay. Hey guys, welcome to the show. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm in the hotel room recording the opening of today's show. Just the introduction here to my guest, April Rain, on my iPhone in the hotel room because I just I didn't get it done. But I'm getting it done because I wanted to make sure I posted all these great interviews that I did before I left, including today, my conversation with April Rain. Uh, I thought it was so so special. First, first of all, she's uh, a lawyer practiced law for over 15 years, but then her life take this crazy turn when her commentary on the lack of underrepresented communities represented in the 2015 Oscar nominations compelled her to tweet a now very famous hashtag, Oscars so white, which then turned into a movement that brought about real change. And the Academy made its most systemic change in its 90 year history by committing to doubling the number of women and the number of people of color in its voting membership. And so now she's an activist and she advocates for the representation of marginalized communities in all areas of the entertainment and and arts and, and tech through. She does a lot of speaking and digital and traditional media, corporate consulting. And I have known her just actually through Twitter. And we have been talking for the last year and a half here on the show. And, and she's just she's just really great. And we had an awesome conversation, which opened with her talking about her dog that just passed away. And it was so poignant and honest. And then she gave me some frank advice about parenting, which I really enjoyed. We talked about some mental health issues related to athletes and female athletes. And then we talked about diversity and inclusion, of course. And finally, uh, a little bit about the vaccines. It was fun. It was thoughtful. It was funny. I always love talking to April. And I hope that you will uh, follow her on Twitter and join the movements that she's been a huge part of, including Sister Scotus, which is to try to get the first black woman pointed to the Supreme Court. All right. Here now, my conversation with April Rain. No, now I am recording, and I do want you to talk about your dead dog, which is what you just said. You just met my dog, and then I learned that your dog passed away two weeks ago at age nine or 11. Oh, uh, no, she was 11. We yeah. got her when she was about two and a half. Uh, and she was, we were talking about the fact that she was a, they say foster failure, and I don't like that. So we call her forever foster uh, because she was definitely not a failure. So, you know, we waited until, I'm trying to remember how old the kids were, like 10 and 14 or maybe nine and 13, something like that. That's not, the math's not right. To get her, because we wanted to make sure the kids were going to be old enough to, you know, walk her and do the stuff. And we live on the East Coast, so that means snow. And, you know, so I didn't want to be the only person. Yeah. But we had waited a while, and, and I had grown up with dogs, but this was our first, this is my first as an adult, and she was just fantastic. She was great for this family, which means she didn't ask for anything, she she wanted to go out, like, once a day, and then maybe a couple of times to pee, and, like, that was it. She didn't need to go running anywhere. She was a house dog. She didn't really like other dogs. It's not that she didn't like them, she just didn't know what to do with them. Right. So she was just much more people-oriented than animal-oriented. Right. And, and so in May, I had um, a full workup done because she was a senior dog. She was 11-ish. We don't know exactly because she was a, a rescue. And the vet said everything looked great, you know, because, you know, you, as they get older, yeah. just as with humans, you worry about the heart and you worry about the knees and all the rest of that stuff. And mm. she was fine. And then I had taken her out to do her business. And I noticed that was a little off, no blood, but it was just a little off. And I thought, okay, so maybe I'll... I'll, you know, take her to the vet if things don't clear up. And then she was walking into the family room and I saw her like stumble, which was weird. And then she sort of collapsed on her bed and and she was sitting, laying funny. It just looked odd. So I thought, okay, well, maybe she's broken her hip or whatever. And then it just de-escalated from there and she was gone in like 10 minutes. Oh, April. Yeah. So now I haven't gotten, it's been two weeks and I haven't gotten rid of all of her stuff yet. So I need to like call the, the shelters and whatever and see if they'll take old food and, you know, her crate and and all the rest, obviously not her bed and that kind of thing. And then 
it's just the little things. Like I'll drop something on the kitchen floor as I'm cooking. And I'm like, oh, I got to pick that up. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have a dog who's going to come in and, and lick my kitchen floors after I'm finished. Yeah. Or, you know, when I pull into the driveway, I don't see that little nose pressed up against the window waiting for me to come inside. Even though I've only been gone for 10 minutes, she always acted yeah. like I was coming home from a tour like, yes. from Iraq or something. <laughs> um, so, you know, but I also recognize this is a horrible thing to say, but I recognize that I'm in a year of transition and I'm going to be moving from East Coast to West Coast and probably driving, you know, so that I can have the car or whatever, uh, as opposed to flying and then having my stuff trucked across the country. And maybe she didn't want to go like, you know, maybe this that trip was going to be too much for her. I am very thankful that, you know, I was home with her so that, you know, we could say goodbye to each other. And she knew that she was loved and would be taken care of. What you don't know, and then I'll end it here, is that no one comes. Like, there is no 911 for dogs. And so if your dog, and, and this happened in the evening, so if your animal is in trouble, you have to get that animal to the emergency vet, which is probably like a bazillion dollars, right? Because they're yep. open all night yep. long. Yep. Um, but, you know, but she was 80 pounds. And so getting her you know, there was no time for me to get her there in time, but even getting her lifeless body into the car. And then when she gets to the vet, it's not emergent because she's already gone. And so you just sit there until they're ready to come get the dog. So we were sitting there with my deceased dog in the back seat for about an hour. And then they're talking to you on the phone, like, what would you like to do? Would you like a communal creation? I'm using my air quotes, which means I guess they put them all in the burner, sorry, at one time. Or would you like a private cremation? Right. Because, I mean, I know that you've heard the stories with humans where, you know, you're not exactly sure if you're getting like Uncle Ralph's back. You're just getting <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. That's horrible. But anyway, um, but uh, and obviously communal creation is much cheaper than private, but you're, you're in this moment of grief. So, of course, I said private and I'm sure I paid too much money for some dog's ashes. And then you have to go and pick them up and they give you a nice little urn. Um, and they also, which I was not expecting, give you a little paw print like in Plaster Paris. I'm not sure that. That was the right size, my dog's oh, car. Oh, no. But, but I have it. I, I'm sure I paid too much money for it. So rest in peace, Bella. I hope you are chasing bunnies the way you did in your dreams. Thank you so much for sharing all that. That was way, that was an overshare. Apparently no, I like, needed a little therapy today. Thank you. No, let me just say, every time I've talked to you, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It it always goes great because you have so much to say about so many things. You're very honest and vulnerable and funny and, and, and obviously brilliant. But like today I was like, what am I, you know, I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. We finally worked it out because I kept screwing things up with my schedule. And You and, did not screw things up. You chose family first. Don't do that. Well, thank you for mentioning that. Um, yeah, I had to go get my daughter. It was sick and we had to reschedule. Anyway, point is... Like, I wasn't expecting to, to hear that story today, but I really appreciate it because I've never lost a dog and you just helped me prepare a little bit to know how things work and so on. You also, of course, in your way, made it funny and and thoughtful. And um, I just love that. And it's almost like I just the reason I stopped to just acknowledge you, to, you know, is because as the host of the podcast, I'm always thinking, is this good? Who should I talk to? And it's like, to me, I'm like, I could just, I could have hit stop and just posted that. And it would have been entirely worth talking to April because it was so thoughtful and interesting. So thank you for, for being vulnerable and honest. And, and I didn't know a lot of those things happen when your dog dies. So, so let me just ask you, how often do you find yourself? One more question about the dog, because I think it's yeah. interesting um, and loss in general. How often do you personally find yourself having the conversation thinking about the dog and then kind of like as the reasoning went about you, you moving and maybe the dog wanted to stay and having these kind of justifications in your mind. Like, do you, do you, does that chatter happen all day a few times since the two weeks, you know, closest to the loss for you? And, and do you recognize that you're, you're, you're thinking about your, your loss? Um, probably a couple of times a day. 
I would say. So yesterday we had a tornado warning, not just a watch, but, you know, something is imminent here on the East Coast in the DMV. And Bella hated thunder, hated And as she got older, it got worse. You know, when she was younger, three through seven, she was able to sleep right through it. Mm. As she got older, she would shake uncontrollably. And we tried the Thunder shirt. Um, We tried. You can go on YouTube and you can get like there's music to calm dogs. I'm just giving you. I didn't know. I did. I'm, it's fine. Yes. I you, you clearly love your dog and wanted to save it. The grief. I just I'm saying I didn't know there was a thing called a thunder shirt. And you have yes. to admit, and I know you will. Those two words are that's a funny thing. A product, a thunder shirt. Oh, for sure, yeah. for sure. But I like to envision like really buff guys, you know, at the gym wearing their thunder shirt with the guns out and you know whatever. But yes, it is an it is a, an anxiety reducing thing for dogs. Did not work for Bella. So even. Eventually, we had to get her prescription. So she was on that that booger sugar. She, I mean, she was she was on, you know, so you have to give them the little pills in the pill pockets. You know what pill pockets are. When yeah, you I know what pill pockets medicine. are. But, okay. but I don't know what, like, it was like an anti-anxiety, like, med or something? Yes. Yeah. Yes, just to slow her down. And sometimes she would go to sleep. So anyway, if we knew a, a storm was coming, you would give it to her beforehand. So it would kick in by the time the first thunderclap happened, right? Because if you wait until you hear the first thunderclap, it's too late and she's already freaked out. Um, and you would see, you know, she would go into the darkest recesses. She would go into my closet because it was dark and right, quiet and right. whatever. Anyway, so yesterday we had a, a tornado warning and I was thinking to myself, Bella would have completely freaked out and I'm kind of glad that she's not here because I probably would have overdosed her um, just to get her to calm down because it was a a major storm. So it's little things like that that I would think about all the time. So I always I I think a lot about since uh, I am so close with this dog now and I had cats growing up. I never had a dog. I love this dog. We're really close. She follows me everywhere. The pandemic has brought us like really close because I'm home and and uh, and even losing the corporate gig, I was started. So we got really close. And so I think about her, what it'll be like when she's gone. Not that often, but enough. And I wonder about the difference between losing a dog that I'm so close with, so ever present, and obviously losing losing a human and how that is different. Losing a cat, my my, my recollections there. Uh, and what I wonder, and I had this really petty thought, and I want to know what you think of it. And I've never asked anybody because it's so selfish and petty, but it's like. I always think that when Indy, who you just met, dies, it'll be really bad and horrible and all the things that you're describing, really challenging. But so I'll just get another dog to replace her. Like, you can't do that with a human. But I think you can. I, I, I want I part of me thinks I can do that. Is is that a ridiculous and stupid thought? And everybody listening, please at me and tell me why I'm a jackass for even saying it. But I do. I'm just saying out loud. I think I can replace it to some extent. You cannot replace Indy. You can t- attempt to fill the void um, that Indy leaves behind with another animal who will show you unconditional love. Right. That. I th- yeah, I, th- I think that's the difference. Like, and so, you know, that, that's another thing. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm moving across the country and I travel a lot. And so traveling meant having to put Bella in a, you know, in a kennel. And I found a really nice farm that was overly expensive, you know, but she, yeah, but there were yeah. less dogs there and they let her have run of the house and they probably let her up on the furniture, which I never did. All those things. Right. Um, and so now I don't have to do that. And now I don't have to think about what am I going to do with Bella before I go out of town? So right. it provides me a bit more spontaneity, but it, it's also as, as a result of a, of a broken heart. And so I know that many folks, um, as their dogs get older, they get a younger dog, um, sometimes to put a little more pep in the step of the older dog, but also to make a bit more of a transition. So it's not like the house is empty when the older dog wow, transitions. I've, I've never heard of that, but it makes a lot of sense. I've never heard anybody say that or do that, but that makes total sense for both reasons. You just, oh, wow. Huh. Hey, can I ask you about your life transition at all? Or is it probably, is it top yes. secret? What are no, you doing? I, when, since when am I, there are no closed books or chapters or pages with you, Pete Dominic. Come well, on. that's very yeah. thoughtful. I appreciate it. I can always edit something out. Uh, but, but so, <laughs> so uh, that's a big 
change. Tell people kind of your station in life in terms of your kids and stuff and and then why you're you're making this. Also, tell us about April. Where have you lived in your life and for how long? (laughs) Oh, goodness. Okay, so that's a longer answer. My dad was in the military. uh, So I was born in Newark, New Jersey, but he went into the military, I think when I was about seven or so. Um, So late 70s, mid to late 70s. And we moved around a lot, like every year and a half, it it was something new. So so the majority of the time I spent south of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, So we were in um, Washington, D.C. for a while. We were also in Maryland for a while before now. Um, and then uh, Texas, Louisiana, and Georgia are the three states uh, in which I attended high schools, three different high schools, three different states. Um, and then I went back to Texas uh, because I knew I wanted to go to law school and I wanted to be in one place for seven years, which I had not Huh. ever done. Huh. Uh, and so I picked the University of Texas for undergrad and law school. And then uh, after law school, I got a job back on the East Coast, which was great because both my parents and my husband's parents um, lived on the East Coast as well. And we were trying to get back to this time zone. Uh, and so we came back here to the DMV and we've been here since 1994, the year I graduated from law school. Uh, and so now here we are, whatever that math is, 27 years later, um, Um, And uh, I have a child who just graduated from college in May uh, and he's doing really well and currently based in Los Angeles um, working. And I have a my second child, youngest child, is going off to college this fall. So we have one going out and one coming in. Um, I'm also in the midst of a divorce uh, and we are pleased about that. And um, so I'm going to be an empty nester. I'm going to be a divorcee or single mom or whatever. Um, And people have always assumed because of the Oscar so white thing that I lived in LA or New York anyway. And, um, so I had narrowed it down to those two places and I'm over winter and my knees are over winter. <laughs> so LA it is. Uh, and so in the next, so I am in the process of getting our house in which we've lived since 2002, I think, um, getting that house ready for sale. And then I'm out of here. You know, as soon as we can get my daughter into her dorm room, I am packing up my shoes and my plants and we're going to Los Angeles. I have a million questions about everything you just said. Please. Super fascinating. I do. One thing I am curious about is what your dad's job in the army, right? Yes. He was a physician's assistant. Uh, he was a huh. warrant officer, if that means anything to you. Um, but he was in the medical profession. So not a doctor, but, you know, more a bit more than a medic. Uh, and he still does that work as a physician's assistant. He's 78 years old and he currently works for the Georgia State Prison System um, through covid through all of that, he loves his job and he feels like he provides dignity to incarcerated men who might not get it otherwise. And oh, my God. Can I interview him? Yeah, sure. He probably has a lot to say oh, wow. if, if he he's also he's also the oldest of 10. So he's got stories. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> can I do a show with him? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. I'm sure he would love oh my, that. Okay, so, and then to just want to clear up, just in case anybody doesn't know, I only learned this a few years ago, and I grew up on the East Coast. The DMV refers to Delaware, Maryland, Virginia Sir, area. Sir, no. D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. We don't claim Delaware. D.C., because, you know, it's you can, it, within like an hour, hour and a half, you can be through all three states. So, yes, D.C., well, Maryland, Virginia. I'm just going it, to, it's so embarrassing that I didn't know that I may edit that out. <laughs> I'm only editing my mistakes out. Your choice. So um, huge, major transition in your life, which is a super fascinating place to be. And I don't know. I I don't want to project, but I am terrifying to some extent, maybe. And just uncertainty. Uncertainty. Okay, so you're not worried. So I want to know why. But did you say where your daughter was going into college? Where? About in the country? She is staying uh, for her 
privacy reasons. I'm not going to tell you specifically, but yeah. she is staying in this area. Yeah. So I just the, wanted to know if you were going to be like, because my question I'm is, no, I'm li- yeah. When we had that conversation, we, yeah. you know, what what does that what does that look like for you? Do you want me to stay? Do you need me to stay? How is? And she, to her credit, is just a wonderfully independent person Mm -hmm. um and and i have no qualms about leaving you know about being a plane right away should she ever want or need me here could i ask you a parenting advice question yes um i'm struggling to simply keep my daughter off the phone or the screens and and to kind of explain that and to negotiate that with her was that something that you had to deal with with your daughter? Your daughter, because they're not that different in age, and and this kind of generation, or you know, anybody growing up in the last fifteen years with the screens, but especially now with the social media and the the phones the way they are. So, was that an issue at all for you? Why are you struggling to keep her off the screens? Because she's always. Oh, why? Why do I think she shouldn't be on them? I guess so. Because we think that her brain and the brain needs to have to be bored to be anything to trouble to, to, to troubleshoot to be creative to think about what she has to do today um, she'll get up and walk to her screen and before she washes her face brushes her teeth eats something does anything we like her to you know maybe do a little meditation something but she goes right to the screen her brain is on that screen we think that sustained periods of time prevent them from doing a lot of other things that they could, should, and need to be doing. Do you find that is her schoolwork suffering because of her screen time? I don't think her schoolwork is suffering. I think. Her okay. Cre- Does she have friends? Tons. Okay. Um, is she a good person? She, oh, well, that's uh, subjective. I think that she, you're her daddy. I think that she has um, issues sometimes being fair and and okay. kind. Do you think that comes from the screen time, despite the fact that she has tons of friends? Yes, I think she's different with her friends than she is at home to some extent. I think she's so, I, you know, well, she's, that's, but that's parenting. That's different. She has she has trouble being fair with you and your partner. Is that what her, you're saying? Her mother and her sister mainly. OK, well, that but. Is that related to the screen time or is that just being a teenager? The main problem, which covers all of this, is she has, I think, a certain um, challenging time being off the phone. She needs to be on it. She can't do a normal task and almost anything for a sustained amount of time. Clean her room or (laughs) do stuff outside, exercise, write, paint, um, even hold a conversation without wanting to go back to that. And then when she's bored, the the horror of the boredom because she doesn't have the screen is too much for me to take. I just so you give I, her the phone back. No, I lose my I lose my composure. And I told her, you are a very lucky person that you have an amazing home. You're so privileged. And it, I just can't hear you complain about your life. I go jump in the pool that you have. It's a beautiful day. And I can't. And I'm not saying that was a good way to handle it, but I'm saying, like, I, I don't know. I couldn't I can't deal with all of this. Uh, not I can't deal with all of this. I think it's terrible for her to to, to it, she's addicted. It's like an addict to me. The phone okay. for her. She Are you it. not on your phone all the time? No, no. I have okay. sustained periods and I try to let them know. I announce it. I'll be off my phone in the garden because my phone distracts me and makes me sad. Okay. Yes. I mean, I, I think to answer your question directly, no, we did not have that struggle. But I think you can probably hear from the questions I'm asking you that we didn't have hard rules about the number of hours you should be on the phone or, you know, or on any screens. Um, I think that in this era, right, that we're living in, that is all screens all the time, whether it's laptop or game console or phone or TV, we're always in front of screens all day long. You and I are both in front of a screen right now, even though you're actually working. Um, So 
I try to pick my battles and, you know, as the questions that I was asking you, are they, are you, you know, is your daughter kind, you know, is, is she well read relatively, even if she's using an ebook right, to, to get that information, is her schoolwork suffering? Does she have, you know, social interactions? If all of those things are happening and yet she's still on the phone, I, for me, that's that's not a battle that that I would wage. But I absolutely understand every every parent goes through yeah. trying to figure out if it's a number of hours or what what that thing is. And you may find that it wanes as her other interests increase as she gets older. She gets you know closer to going to school if she chooses to do that and those kind of things as well. Well, list one more thought on it that I want to get your uh, uh, response to, which is. It's not her fault. It's 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 the phone. It's this generation. If we had this, I always say this. If we had these things, we would have been way worse, just as bad, whatever you want to say. They're awesome. TikTok is amazing. Video games are awesome. Personally, I'm always on social media. I love Twitter. I love all of this stuff. What I see is that my daughter is just so talented in so many ways. I tell her this all the time. She is an amazing leader, so confident, hilarious and creative, but I don't think she's spending enough time in the space to get deeper on a lot of these things that she has so much potential and such a natural uh, innate base for that has nothing to do with us. This is just kind of a nature, but then she doesn't explore it enough. She doesn't do it enough. How do you know? What, but what if she's exploring it online? So you find me, I think, you know, relatively smart and funny and, you know, and personable and, and interactive and what have you. Some of that came from social media. A lot of that probably came from social media because I am truly at my core an introvert and I've got 180,000 followers on Twitter. Right. And so I, I I can absolutely say that Twitter has helped me hone skills, um, leadership skills, right? Um, com- com- comedic skills. So all of those things that you mentioned that she has, she may be exploring them, but in her online community. And I don't know whether you follow each other on social media so that you can see that in real time. But the fact that, you know, she doesn't have a group of people, especially now, because we're in the middle of the panini or the, you know, pond, the replay or whatever you're calling it these days. Um, You know, when she when she can't be in close contact with her friends, this is her way of staying in touch with the world and the news and and all the rest of that stuff. I agree with that. I think that a lot of the the phone the phones have allowed them to socialize in in this crazy time and that's been a really a very good thing and i i absolutely agree with how you say it's affected you and and help you be more creative and use humor and 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 show your leadership and all, all of the activism that you've done but i also think that a lot of that stuff i have to imagine that you established that growing up so many of those skills like i think that you know, we might not deal with our anxieties very well because we don't deal with them. Here's what I mean. And I'll give you one specific example. And then I want to get back to your transition uh, moving and excited to, to learn why. But I'm saying that if I have a problem, uh, um, any kind of anxiety, a fight with my wife, worrying about some news events, anything. Uh, it's easy for me to go distract myself with my screen. But what I really would was best for me in my mind is to take a walk or a run or call a friend, or write, or just be quiet, as opposed to replacing that with a distraction that is the screen. And I know that, and I still do it, and I'm an adult. I don't think my daughter, and I don't think most kids know that, when they're having trouble, they just, boom, they go right to the screen, and it gives them just dessert and distraction, and they don't know how to deal with stuff. And again, it's not their fault, it's our fault, and I think I see that. I think I see that, and I think there's research for that, but, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, but, but why do you think that she isn't dealing with the issue because she's dealing with it in a way that's different than the way that she would do it? Well, right? she's you... be, because she's not dealing with it at all. She's just distracting herself from it. Okay, but is the issue eventually resolved or it just sits there and festers? And if it's festering, is it you saying it's festering or because, for example, my daughter has she she is amazing in the way that when something happens, she 
addresses it in that moment or at least acknowledges that it's happening mm-hmm. and then it's done like it goes into the past and it never comes out again mm-hmm. um a, a quick story she was like four years old and we went to we were in new york city and you know and the kids were young and so we were doing all the touristy things and the ferris wheel that used to be in toys r us and we would go to as they would call it fao shorts um and all the places in, in between and there was like a builder bear kind of store you yeah. know where you get your stuffed animal and you yeah. but this was for little girl dolls um Doll, the dolls were for any gender, but they were, uh, you know, presenting as little girl dolls. Um, and so, you know, you can choose the clothing and all of the stuff that goes with the doll and all the accessories. And so we spent nearly an hour uh, in the store with this, with her creating this doll. We get to the end and you get to put a sound inside the doll, a voice or a song right. or whatever. And she chose the thing and they were out of the thing. And so we said, oh, well, you know, you could choose anything else you want. Absolutely fine. We've spent an hour. Let's go ahead. She said, nope, and put the doll down and walked to the door. And that was it. No crying. Never discussed the doll again. It was over. She had addressed the issue, acknowledged the issue, and moved on. And so what I'm saying to you there is there's a possibility that your daughter just may not address issues in the same way that you do. And so if she has determined in her mind that it's over, it doesn't need to, you know, we don't need to talk about it for two hours. I don't need to write about it or cry about it or whatever. I'm just moving on. Maybe that's also a healthy way of dealing with things. As long as she is acknowledging the issue and not completely burying it under the rug. Yeah. I think, I, I think all of that is wise. And I love that story. What a, what a, what a great story and what an amazing little girl and fun experience and the fact that you can remember it like it's yesterday or tell it like it was is so great. I think that uh, she doesn't change certain bad behaviors. Okay. And we've tried a lot of different things to talk about. I mean, this girl is pretty exceptional. I'm being very specifically nitpicking. She doesn't have anything that could be identified. I don't think as a behavioral issue or a learning disability or anything. I mean, not that there's, Those are just more challenging things to deal with, especially as a parent, not knowing, you know, not being educated on them. But so so she's really and I think she's going to be amazing. I even said I say things are like, I don't even think you need to go to college. I don't even think you need to go to high school. I honestly think I could drop you up in New York City tomorrow and you would become someone who is so well connected and and well suited for any number of careers and then maybe transition in and out. And probably you'll have many relationships. You'll probably have a lot of, you know. People fall in love with you and maybe break a lot of hearts. I don't know. I think you're an exceptional person, but there are certain behaviors, certain things that are done that, that, that she sometimes does. And then she doesn't learn from them. She does them again. And, and, and some of them are really challenging and and bad. And so I don't, you know, think that she's addressing them enough, understanding kind of the consequences of when she does something and it, it's really damaging to somebody else. You need to acknowledge that. You need to acknowledge that this person is hurt, that you you took their stuff and ruined it. Or, you know, that's a, that's an easy example. So. Sure. No, I, I agree with that. So, so, you know, and there should be consequences for, um, you know, for actions that we don't like and that we don't want repeated. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you can't just carte blanche because your child is exceptional. Right. And and kids, although they don't act like it, like boundaries and structure right, yeah. and to some extent discipline. So, right. you know, maybe there's a way for you and your wife to figure out how to have that conversation. Maybe it's with someone else, you know, maybe having it with a third party or a therapist or something would be helpful, you know, but I mean, the only thing is, and it doesn't sound like you're doing this at all, but I'm always concerned when parents try to put that light under a bush uh, because because you, your child is doing things differently than what you were taught. Uh, yep. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that we as adults need to unlearn with respect to, you know, every child is, a, is an individual. I know you have more than one child, so you know that. You know, they both came from you, and yet they could not be more different yep. in, in various ways. That's and, that, and that's true for anybody that's got, you know, more than one kid. No, that's really sound advice, and I, I, I really appreciate, well, everything that you're saying. This is, this is great. And I would tell you even more specific but to protect jewel um, of course you know i mean because then you would be able to to be to respond to something even more specific than than the generalities i'm leaving out there but let me ask you let me change back to you and although i love you know i just think about people 
uh, especially because I'm raising girls. And I want to write a book uh, for for men raising daughters that is written from the from a female. So I interview all the women who I admire about their relationship with their father. And I'd love for you to be a part of that if I ever end up doing it, because then I ask women, especially that I admire, hey, this is a thing I'm having trouble with with my daughter. And so that's exactly what I just did with you. And it was awesome. And I really appreciate it. It's a I am moving to Los Angeles because in 2015, I created the Oscar So White hashtag. And since then, I have been on the margins of the entertainment industry, having conversations about equity and inclusion. And so a lot of the work that I do is based in L.A. And, you know, instead of flying back and forth, um, I want to be near the water um, because that's that's a very calming place for me. And it, it just felt like it was time, you know, even. Even before um, my husband and I separated, we were having a conversation about, you know, when the kids leave, what is the plan, you know, um, and the DMV, District of Columbia, Maryland and Virginia has been very good to us in raising our kids and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, but there isn't a whole bunch here with respect to the entertainment industry. So it was either L.A. or New York and New York is too cold. A general question about the work that you've been doing, hashtag Oscar so white, like how do you feel about me describing your work, the, the, the results of your work as several steps forward, some steps back, you try, you see a lot of progress here and there, and then you see something happen uh, that's really like, really, is this still going on? Like, so I'm you know, trying to be really vague in general, but that's kind of how I see it, which is why you're still obviously very much invested in this work. Uh, so you can hit the specifics in terms of maybe what you think you've achieved and what you think, you know, you still there still needs to be where there still needs to be a lot of work done. Yeah, I, I think it's accurate um, that oh, there is so much more work to be done. And and it's unfortunate that every year we get a myriad of examples of, oh, my God, we're still here. You know? And then, and so I, I think what Oscar So White did is shine a spotlight on issues of diversity and equity and inclusion and representation in the entertainment industry. But that's just about it, right? I mean, you can shine a spotlight and not clean the floor where you can see the stain. You know what I'm saying? Um, so and it, the fact that we are still celebrating first, you know, the first woman to do <laughs> yeah. this, the first person of color to do yeah. that, um, means that there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, you know, I started Oscar and White in 2015 because there were no people of color nominated for any of the acting categories for the Oscars happened again in 2016. Right. And, um, and even now we're having issues, um, not necessarily with respect to black folks. And this was never just about black folks, but we're having issues um, with respect to the lack of representation for trans folks and for visibly disabled folks and for the Latinx community and the AAPI community. So I I think this was a conversation starter and not just for the entertainment industry, but for most of the industries, you know, somebody, not me created tech so white, you know, somebody created Brooklyn so white, Uh, you know, and we, but we have these issues with respect to representation presentation in every sector. Um, And so having the conversation, being able to tack on so white at the end so that people can, you know, almost immediately understand where you're going, I think is, is a helpful tool. Um, But, you know, I'm going to keep working and, and there are thousands of people in this country. And in fact, internationally that are doing the same type of work. I mean, I, New Zealand loves me for, I don't know why, but like three or four, I know, but like three or four times a year, they're like, Hey, can we get April on the show? And I'm on their morning program and we're talking about whatever, you know, and, and I don't know, don't, don't even ask me any follow-ups. Cause I don't know what that is. I don't well, know. I, I mean, I don't um, have a, 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 I just, have you thought about living there? You're moving to LA. I mean, New Zealand is supposedly a pretty, that's where the, the, the they, they say the best place to be for uh, societal collapse. I think since they love you, you're going to, somebody will give you a home. No, I have not. But thank you for asking. I'm sure in this, if they would like me to visit, I am happy to come. But I don't want to be more than, a, you know, a three hour plane ride from my children. That's a great you know, that's a that's a great uh, principle. So the the <laughs> issue is not as much necessarily about awards, just to be clear. It's about opportunity and actual work. So directors and electricians and obviously 
the actors who are the most, uh, you know, Visible. public facing. That's that's what you see. But it's also about other industries, m- you know, mechanics. So white, whatever it is, it's just you don't see those other industries. You don't see accountants. You don't see, uh, you know, scientists or doctors, whatever it is. You see actors, you see Hollywood. And so that's why it's such a great place. I think the focus, obviously, uh, it, it's really, really important. But w- what are you like? What has to specifically happen? I mean, like roles have to be written. Projects have to be green lit. Opportunities have to be given. Internships have to be uh, awarded. It's like, what is the what is an example of like the actual action items that really need to happen to create more representation? The change has to start at the top. So I'm not saying we have to replace all the white men who are in charge of everything in every single industry, but it would be great if they would be more open minded to all of these issues regarding equity and representation, because, you know, you can have a middle manager say, oh, yeah, we believe X, Y, Z. And so, you know, but it's different when you've got the CEO or whatever acronym you want to use saying, hey, we're going to completely overhaul the way that we hire people. You know, we're going to go to blind resumes so that HR, you know, the, the person in HR who sees too many, you know, vowels in a name automatically puts that resume to the bottom of the pile because we know that happens. Um, you know, I, I, the CEO, am going to tie my annual bonus to the improvements that we are doing with respect to equity and Ooh, representation. Good... Yes, that, that, that's a big one um, because then you're held accountable because it's affecting your money because what we know is that it's always the bottom line. It's always about the money. So if you're not affecting the money, you're not going to see structural I can, change. I, can, I don't even care if it happens like this, but this is the, the, the dialogue that just played out in my head. Chad, Brad, make sure we hire a black lady for accounting. Now I want to get my bonus. Like, fine. Even if that's, I don't care. You're not going to, he's, if he's not doing it for like out of his own kind of, you know, thoughtful reasoning, fine. That you don't, you don't get your bonus unless you actually create an opportunity or open a door for, for someone who, who has, you know, limited opportunity for the history of, Society. Yes. And what we want to make sure is that the person that is hired feels welcomed and isn't there because they are a diversity hire. Right. We know that that person will probably be qualified, but we don't want it to become a revolving That's door. Great. Yes. Yeah. Let's check off the boxes. Right. We've got 10 more blacks, you know, or 10 more Asians or whatever other offensive thing you want to say. But you look a year from now and they're back down the two because you haven't provided the environment in which folks can thrive. Really great. Um, I, I'm jumping around because when I thought about and plan to talk to you, I said, I wanted to ask these four things. And so I want to ask these four things. And two of them, I wasn't planning on talking about parenting and, and the loss of a pet. So, and I'm <laughs> running out of, I'm not running out of time. I know you're, you're, you're good, but I wanted to ask you this question. Um, uh, Women, uh, obviously, have, have it more difficult. Black folks have it more difficult. So black women have it, you know, a double standard. And there's all kinds of references to that. And as fe- as black female athletes gain more prominence, they are now now we're learning what black women who aren't in the spotlight have always dealt with to a certain extent. And it's really I mean, I read a Twitter thread from this black female doctor today that really educated me on, you know, it was a personal anecdote that she had to deal with. I was like, wow, wow, that's that's a crazy thing that I wouldn't think happened. So you're constantly getting educated in and by now these black female athletes who are so prominent and specifically talking about issues with mental health, uh, you know, and 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 becoming a parent, Serena Williams, uh, um, the what's her name, the the Japanese black ex uh, um Naomi Osaka. Yes, thank you. Forgive me. Uh-huh. And and now, obviously, with Simone Biles, what do you and Shakari Richardson? Let's remember because there's been a double standard there too, um, because she, I think, took THC. I may have the acronyms mixed up. She took THC, I think, before running a race. Um, but Megan Rapino white woman who is fantastic, um, you know, soccer player is actually hawking like CBD, which right. comes from the same marijuana plant. So, it, so yes, we can talk about Simone and, and, um, and Naomi and others, but 
you know, let's go back even further. And we can go back even further and talk about like, you know, my generation and close to yours, Florence Griffith Joyner and Jackie Joyner Kersey and the way those women were treated back in the day as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's been an ongoing problem. We can talk, go back to Jesse Owens. I mean, you know, and he's, he didn't, you know, they wouldn't shake his hand and they thought that he came back. He didn't come back to a hero's welcome. Same thing with Tommy John, you know, and John Carlos, you know, they raised their fist on the on the podium. And, you know, and these were veterans, you know, so you thought that they would they were Olympians, they were winners, and yet they face death threats for years and years and years. So, yes, we can co- focus absolutely on black women athletes and the issues that they're having and how strong they are being standing up for themselves and for their mental health, which I think is crucial Um and, you know, I, I think this is a pivotal moment as people are understanding, you know, definitely I'm 51. So people in my generation, you know, you soldiered through, you know, you may have had PTO paid time off, but you didn't miss a day. Right. And you went you soldiered through grief and anxiety and loss and fatigue and sickness because you didn't want to be seen as not a team player even though you had this paid time off. Um, and so folks in my generation and, and older and some younger as well, just can't fathom taking a mental health day, you know, choosing self um, over a corporation which may not treat you well. You know, let's remember Simone Biles is a sexual assault survivor, right? At the hands of Larry Nasser, as was hundreds and hundreds of other uh, athletes. Yet, and she was not supported the way that she should have um, within the the Olympics organization, and yet she's still there representing them. And so, who knows what gave her the twisties, which is the term that's used for what's happening to her right now? Could it be PTSD? Right? It's it's I you know I'm definitely not a doctor, but could it just be the anxiety of being there and being the face of the Olympics? so soon after everything that's happened, just been too much. And all of the pressure that we as Americans, you know, obviously around the world as well, put on these athletes every four years. Let's remember that these athletes very often are not professionals. They are math teachers. They are engineers. They are people with regular jobs who spend their nights and weekends training for sometimes two minutes (laughs) every four years to stand on a podium and represent us. And for us to say, oh you're soft or you know how could you you know and these are people who say this from the comfort of their couches who haven't been able to do anything right definitely not even on the local stage much less the international one so i i find it hypocritical and and really horrible the the treatment that some of these folks are receiving well my read is that the overwhelming reaction has been really, I think, positive. And I think that we're hearing from a lot of the people we knew we would hear from who are kind of outrage profiteers. And so they just find the target they can and they get as much attention as they can. So if someone's really beloved uh, in a community or in the country um, and they try to take them down, they profit from that. I think that that's always going to happen. There's not much we can really do about that. But my feeling has been that The overwhelming kind of conversation in media and culturally has been that this this is a really brave thing and a very good thing that she did. And some people even saying this may be the most important achievement of hers ever, not the gold medals, not the amazing physical feats, but the fact that she did what she did so publicly here. And and so that's my read. What is your read about kind of the zeitgeist reaction to Simone Biles? I, 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 what I know is that we curate our own timelines, exactly. right? And so, exactly. so you may be seeing, you know, you're seeing the folks who very often are aligned with you, you know, socially, politically, whatever. And so you may not see it. What I do know is that despite going through this in the middle of the Olympics, Simone Biles took to her IG live um, and answered questions mm. of folks about what twisties are. And mm. in fact, um, took us behind the scenes as she was practicing, um, you know, on the the high bar and the fact that she couldn't make her jumps. 
Like, you know, she's the best gymnast in the world. Yep. And yet she's showing us that she cannot land on her feet. So the fact that she's taking the time and felt it necessary to take the time to educate us yep. about what the twisties mean tells me that in part, she's an amazing, generous person because I would not have done it. I am concerned about is that perhaps she experienced enough blowback on social media and traditional media that that she felt it necessary to educate us all about exactly what she's going through mentally and how that affects her physically. You know, if you are, I don't know what it is, 10, 12 feet in the air and you can't feel part of your body, mm. um, you know, and, and all you've got is, you know, three inches of cushion beneath you and you don't know whether you're going to land on your feet or on your neck, y you don't do the routine. Right. That, that's not a hard uh, but I, choice. But I just as you're explaining this, like what I'm thinking is it's really interesting what she's explaining. It's great that she's explaining it. But if you know anything about her and even if you didn't, um, but if you knew anything about it, you would know about her story. She's the most famous gymnast potentially ever and that her life story has never been easy. Um, her childhood wasn't easy necessarily. Um, and then obviously being sexually assaulted and then USA Gymnastics letting her down. So then she still was the best at all that. So, you know, judge her if you will, but look at your own life and say, have, what have you accomplished and what have you overcome? But my point is like, I don't care. It's not my business. What's going on? If someone says, if you said, listen, I'm not doing any interviews for a while. I'm dealing with some stuff. I'd be like, you do, you take care of yourself. There's anything I can do. That's so as it relates to regular general society, the, the idea that somebody would come to them, I'm struggling with a mental health issue. I just lost my dog. I need some time. My kid, my, I just, whatever it is, whatever it is, that's your, you should have that prerogative in society and work and, and, and culture should support you. I think what she's doing is helping us understand that we have a long way to go. But that's my point, that it's not really my business what your mental health challenge is. We have to look at it like a compound fracture of your leg bone. Well, I, I would push back just a little bit and say, no, look at it as a mental health issue. Right. But but it is as serious as a compound fracture. Right. So I, I don't want to you, know, you see what I'm saying? I, I don't want to. Sure. Yes. OK. Um, but what you're saying is that you don't have the entitlement issues that millions of people in this country have. And that's a great thing. But we need to bring more of those folks along. You know, how, why do you think you're entitled to an explanation about why an athlete can't perform? Because I support way? you and I have because I support you and I love to watch you. That's why. Well, that's great. But why won't you support me even if I'm standing in the stands? Because I don't I, I can't do this improv much longer because I don't <laughs> care how you stand in because you're not because you're not flying. I like to watch you fly. You're the only person I know right. who can fly, so I want to watch you fly, not stand in the stands and support your teammates. Get out there. I and, hear that. And I hear that. But what that means is that you're centering yourself and the experience <laughs> that you want to have. Right. Not you, Pete Dominic, but the person no, I'm talking no, that's exactly to. Right? What, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, you're centering yourself because, because you know what it is? A lot of those people, and this may sound a little harsh, those people are losers. They haven't won anything in life. And so when they see someone on stage, you know, at any level, gold, sil silver, bronze, it, they are representing America. And so in those few minutes as the national anthem plays, those people finally feel like they won something. Right. Even if those people are racist, which is really interesting. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I would never invite you over to my home for dinner, but I'm going to cheer for you because your medal is my medal. And then after those three minutes and 30 seconds are over, those people go back to right. being hateful again. And that that's the unfortunate part for those who have never won anything. Mm -hmm. uh, they get to project their themselves into these athletes. And so that's why they want to see them win at all costs. I, and I also think it's important to, to sometimes say, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in, in a conversation uh, as serious as important about this, two things can be true at once. I can both be disappointed that you're not performing because I love your performances as a gymnast, a comedian, a singer. A singer would be a great example. You, 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 you can't perform tonight because you don't have a voice. I can both be disappointed, but also understanding and supportive of the choice you made. Both things are, 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 are fair here. So... 
That's um, right. And I, and I think that's where I, I'm not even disappointed because what I also know is that SUNY stepped all the way up. Right. And now she has the gold. And I'm not saying that was intentional on Simone's part by any means, but I I believe it's that we shouldn't lose Great lose point. sight of the fact that SUNY has her gold now and she may not have if yep. Simone was still in and the competition. I didn't, by the way, and I didn't even know who she was until two days ago. So um, Right. And the, and the last thing I'll say on this is God forbid Simone had gone through and injured herself. Um, in, in the all around, imagine what the team would have felt if she had been there injured and whether they could have performed as well as they well, did and gotten the silver well, had they known that she had been ca- carried out on the stretcher. The, the the maybe the more important question, if you'll forgive me, is imagine what her former coaches would have felt. And they the answer to that is nothing. They would they they would make you perform if you were injured. That's one of the big issues with sports. And certainly USA Gymnastics is my understanding. Um, before I let you go, I just wanted to get your take. I know you're tweeting, talking a lot about just the, the vaccination issue. And so where are you at personally? I like your moral compass. You've made mine better. Like, how are you feeling about those who don't get vaccinated? Is it a short conversation or reaction or is it more nuanced and I don't know, compassionate? Yeah, I don't do. Um, <laughs> so, OK, so I, I, I'll be very honest here. When they initially started talking about the vaccines, I was reluctant um, because it seemed like it was happening too fast. And, oh, if you can get this vaccine done in three months or six months, how come we don't have vaccines for everything else? Like, so clearly you can do it, you know, when when under the gun, what's what's going on? Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, thinking about the, the disparities that black folks specifically, but all people of color have have experienced at the hands of healthcare professionals made me incredibly reticent. And then, but this was all before they started rolling out the vaccines, right? And then folks were getting them. They weren't dying. People were getting better. And so when it came turn for me, I was right there. Um, And I got the Johnson and Johnson one and done. I don't know that anybody cares, but you know, but that was the one that was offered to me. And so that's the one that I took. My kids are both vaccinated. I feel like now we've had months and months and months of um, information, good information from credible doctors about why it's necessary. So if you're still choosing not to get the vaccine, you're putting yourself and the people around you at risk. And I don't have any time for you. And, you know, and I'm a person who travels and is on planes and trains and automobiles. Um, You know, I am a person who has a child who um, has, uh, she has asthma, Uh, you know, so it's not a major thing, but she could be compromised. Right. Um, I have two parents in their seventies, you know, so it's a short conversation for me. If you say you're not getting vaccinated, It tells me a lot about your politics and who you are as a person with respect to community. And so I would prefer just not to continue a conversation. Have you tried to convince anybody that said they weren't? No, that's not my business. (laughs) I just, I mean, why, who, where would I find those people? I don't know. I I don't, I don't, don't, they're not in my, because that's, that's not my circle that, you know what I mean? That's not. And so am I going to go out and evangelize? No. And again, we have healthcare professionals. I think part of the problem is that we have yokels from all over the place telling us why it's not good to get the vaccine with absolutely no science or, or medical training behind it to back it up. Um, But there are enough doctors and healthcare professionals who, can give us um, the truth about the vaccines. And so now we may need a booster. And now, you know, Delta variant is coming on strong and it's as you know contagious as chickenpox. You give me a booster, I'm absolutely fine. I will I'm ready to sign up. If it means that, you know, people, more people are going to live and I have a better chance of not getting sick, why not? I appreciate everything you said today. I always love talking to you. It's been too long. I'll let you go enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And it sounds like you're very busy and have a lot of excitement coming your way. So congratulations and good luck on your exciting new phase. And I really appreciate talking to you. And I I hope to hear about the the transition to the West Coast. That's going to be awesome. Thank you very much. I am very excited and looking forward to the rest of 2021. Uh, And I always enjoy being in conversation with you. So see you on the Twitters. 
All right, there you go, April Rain. Check her out on Twitter. And as always, thank you for your support. And I hope you don't mind me recording these on my iPhone, the closing of the show. All right, that's it. I'll talk to you tomorrow with bioethicist Dr. Arthur Kaplan answering all of our questions about the bioethics surrounding COVID, vaccine, mandates, and I got to tell you, he doesn't care anymore. He lets it all out, and it's awesome, and that will be on tomorrow's Stand Up. Time to go back to vacation. Thanks for listening, folks. Take it away, John Carroll. Trees, you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creep kidneys, you got to stand up. Stand up. I think you're driving wheels in a leaking grease. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep in sight. You got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to Stand up, that's right, you got to rise up, you got to stand up, you got to stare the devil straight in the eyes, you got to let him know, it's his turn to go, see it clear and all you hear is a lie, do get up off of your butt, get down off of your fence, and even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well they'll begin to listen when you start making sense, and you stand. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of a stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up All right, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be told up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand